challenges that each school faces, how technology will speak to those challenges, and how each school can positively impact teaching across the campus and beyond the hedges. Uh, so thank you for joining us in these, in these important conversations. I look forward to listening myself. And uh, let me uh, briefly introduce our moderator, Josh Eiler. He's the director of the Center for Teaching Excellence, also an adjunct associate professor of humanities. Uh, Josh became director of Rice's Center for Teaching Excellence in August 2013. Prior to this, he had been associate director of a similar center at George Mason University. Uh, he also was tenured as a faculty member in English at Columbus State University in Georgia. Josh oversees all the CTE's initiatives, which are designed to enhance and support the teaching at, at Rice. His current projects, as if he weren't busy enough, uh, include the book, How Human Beings Learn, A New Paradigm for Teaching in Higher Education, which is under contract with the University of Nebraska Press. So let me cede the floor to Josh, and uh, we will continue. Thanks. Thanks, Fred. Thanks uh, to Rick and Susan, as well as the Program Committee for Ciencia for setting all of this up. Um, it's a real honor to have been invited to moderate uh, this inaugural conversation with two of our, uh, our deans here at Rice. Um, halfway over to McMurtry Auditorium today, I realized that I'd left the biographies back in my office, and I briefly considered creating radical, fictive biographies for everyone. But then I immediately turned around and went back and got them. So here are the official biographies of our, our two esteemed guests. First, Nicholas Shumway, Dean of Humanities and Francis Moody Newman Chair and Professor of Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, Nicholas received his PhD in 1976 from UCLA with a concentration in Hispanic literature and linguistics. After receiving his doctorate, he taught at Pepperdine University, Indiana University Northwest, Yale, and the University of Texas at Austin. At Yale, he chaired the Latin American Studies program for three years and directed the Spanish language program for eight. In 1987, he received tenure at Yale and was promoted to full professor in 1992. After 14 years at Yale, he accepted an appointment in 1993 at the University of Texas as the Tomas Rivera Regents Professor of Spanish. Two years later, he became director of the UT Teresa Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies, a position he held for 11 years. From 2008 to 2010, he served as chair of the UT Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and in July of 2010, he became dean of humanities and the Francis Moody Newman Professor of Humanities here at Rice. Lynn Ragsdale, our Dean of Social Sciences and Radoslav Sanoff Chair of Public Affairs, as well as Professor of Political Science, has been the Dean of the Social Sciences at Rice since 2006. She's a member of the Political Science Department uh, and holds the chair, uh, the, the Sanoff Chair that I mentioned just a second ago. She holds her PhD from the University of Wisconsin and has written five books and numerous articles in the American Presidency and Elections. Her major areas of research include American politics, the presidency, and electoral behavior. So really honored that the two of you uh, volunteered to be here today. Uh, the, I want to discuss the format. We have three questions that have been predetermined by the Ciencia folks. Uh, and so the deans have been given these questions in advance. What I'm going to do is alternate who begins the discussion each time. Uh, they have between 15 and 20 minutes total for their remarks. So what that means is that we'll have about 40 minutes of the comments and then about 20 left for Q&A. So I hope that uh, we'll have generated a lot of, uh, a lot of questions uh, for our speakers. So with that said, I'm going to begin. Uh, Lynn, I'd like to begin with you for the first question, which is what is the biggest challenge and or opportunity in teaching facing your school? Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you, uh, especially on this gorgeous day, taking some time out to uh, explore these issues. And I think Nick and I both agree that we want this to be very conversational. I think we're going to keep our remarks 
in answer to these questions relatively relatively simple and relatively brief. Um, I want to just foreshadow the, the initial question of what are the primary challenges and opportunities by focusing a little bit on social science as a collection of disciplines, in part because I think one of the motivators for the question of challenges and opportunities is actually the is somewhat discipline specific. And so for those of you who are not wildly familiar with all of the departments in the social sciences, they include anthropology, psychology, sociology, political science, economics, sport management, and linguistics. And I hope I didn't miss one. Um, but th the purpose of all of those disciplines and the reason why, for instance, Nick um, shuffled around and I gladly took sport management and linguistics is because the departments collectively are about human behavior and about being able to make empirical statements about human behavior. And in fact, that's what informs all of the curriculum in social science, whether it's talking about the global economy or it's talking about marriage and the family or it's talking about the words that people use in everyday conversation. And so one of the things that, that at least from a social science perspective you have to begin to grapple with is how that aspect of discussion about human behavior really informs the rest of what we might be talking about. And the pivotal part is, of course, that humans are unpredictable. They talk back, right? It's not as though you, in other words, if I go back when I first started teaching in the, in the early 1980s, and I, I'm an expert on American politics, and so any textbook on American politics had three things that were immutable facts about human behavior at that time. One was the Cold War was indefinite. The other was there would be no major economic collapse similar to the Great Depression. And the third was there would be very unlikely for a person of color to be president of the United States. Now, all of those things, of course, turned out to be false. We ended up with uh, the end of the Cold War in 1989. We ended up with a major economic collapse in 2008. And we have an, our first African-American president. And so one of the things that's unique about social science is making sense empirically about human behavior, which is always a moving target. And so... To get to the first question, actually one of the, the big problems, if you will, or challenges that we face is that people actually like to study human behavior. It's actually a really popular set of majors. Um, we have 200, over 200 psychology majors at Rice. We have almost 200 psych, uh, economics majors at Rice. We have um, the, the largest sort of uh, classroom sizes at Rice, so for instance, the average class across the entire curriculum in economics has got 43 people in it, um, almost 50 in psychology. So these are very, very popular, very large sorts of, of uh, disciplines. Uh, in addition, our intro classes are, you know, sort of bursting at the seams. So we typically run about 600 students a year in intro to econ. We run 700 students a year in intro to psych. And... That becomes both a challenge and an opportunity. And certainly from the perspective of the theme here of technology, it becomes an interesting sort of dilemma. Because when, of course, the first sort of wave of discussions about MOOCs came on, there was a lot of attention to the intro classes, very, very large classes, to say, well, maybe we should be taking those classes online. And as a, as a side note, the social sciences have two classes that I would call TOOCs instead of MOOCs, which are tiny online classes. Um, and, and in both cases, they're summer classes. They're solely online. But they're teaching very, very small numbers of students. Roughly between four and eight students a summer go through these particular classes. Um, but, but the idea of taking a large class online was actually a fairly important point of discussion among the social science faculty. And interestingly, I got no one to say, oh yes, I would love to do this online version of the particular class that, I, that I've been investing in. And 
at first I thought, huh, I didn't realize that social science faculty were that sort of set in their ways. Um, but actually it wasn't really about that at all. It was indeed about the unpredictability of human behavior and the fact that people really felt that if they were going to spend the time to videotape themselves and put, put the uh, online course together, they would be every year videotaping substantial portions of the course because of the ongoing sort of shifting nature of human, human behavior. So, so what's interesting about this challenge for us is that we have not gone online. I think the social sciences lag the rest of the university by quite a bit in terms of the number of courses that, that have an online component. But at the same time, we've done other things that I think move in the direction of being consistent with what we study. And that is to, to sort of move to a more real world analysis of human behavior, which takes people outside the classroom or brings things into the classroom that are actually sort of hands-on, experimentation, observation, those kinds, of, those kinds of things. And so whereas we haven't done the sort of online piece that I would have, I, I guess I would have perhaps thought someone would say, yes, I'd love to do that. Uh, instead, what I've seen is that over the last five or six years, we've been moving very specifically toward using technology and using techniques that we know work in terms of active learning. Uh, and so we have a number of, of uh, courses across departments that essentially either flip classrooms or are sort of classes outside of class. In other words, that the, these are classes that actually take place within the city of Houston. Uh, or they take place uh, outside of, of a, a truly academic setting in some way. And so we have roughly about 50 courses that essentially do active learning in, in that kind of way. So in various ways, technology is used in those classes, but it's really more an answer to the first question, which is how do you study human behavior most effectively? So let me stop there and turn it over to... Am I not on? Am I on now? You're always on. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Lynn, by the way, is my favorite dean, and there are obvious reasons here. <laughs> Actually, I like the others, too. But the biggest challenge we have in the humanities, in some sense, is reasserting exactly what humanities do. And I'm very glad that Lynn took the tax, she said, when she said that they want, and I might be saying this wrong, to look at human behavior empirically. Um, in Humanities, empiricism is not a bad word, but empiricism is something that we regularly challenge. And I would like to talk about some of the things that I think really distinguish the humanities and then talk about how these might be used in a, uh, a, 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 a taking advantage of some of the modern uh, technology. First thing I'd like to say is that all humanities disciplines, philosophy, art, literature, religion, are historicized. We are very concerned with the past. And we're so concerned about the past that we usually talk about the past in the present. We will say, why does Juliet say is a rose, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? What does Augustine have to say about this? What are Plato's ideas on this? So we live in the world where everything is historicized. And you really can't talk about the uh, uh, humanities without taking into effect into account what we say about the past. The past is always present. The second thing that I think really distinguishes the humanities is that we don't really believe in obsolescence. I don't think anybody here would say, well, gee whiz, I read John Rawls last night. I don't need Plato anymore. That simply won't happen. And I don't think anybody is going to say, oh, I heard Philip Glass's Einstein on the beach, uh, so I don't have to listen to Bach anymore. We live in a world where things simply do not become obsolescent. Then the last thing that I would say about the humanities is that, and I know I'm going to get into some trouble on this, we don't like conclusions. Uh, we like to think that all human knowledge is constantly ready to be discussed again. 
In this regard, I'd like to tell a little anecdote. Uh, I wrote my doctoral dissertation over 40 years ago. Uh, just 40 years ago, I finished it. Thank you. But I wrote my dissertation on a wonderful Argentine writer by the name of Jorge Luis Borges. And it was my pleasure to meet him uh, several times in Buenos Aires and interview him. And um, I'm a naive graduate student. I'm absolutely flattered that this amazingly creative intellect is taking time to talk to me. And at one time, I used the word truth. And he looked at me and said, Nicolas, truth is very boring. I was appalled. How could he possibly say that truth is boring? That's what we're searching for. We seek the truth, the truth will make us free. So, no, he says, because once you know the truth, what are you going to talk about? And his point is that if you simply repeat the commonplace knowledge, that's the end of the discussion. And what we're about is a constant discussion. So yes, we have to reread the same things over and over again because the answers keep changing over time. There's a wonderful anecdote of a history professor who, an older man, goes to a graduation seminar, a seminar, a ceremony, and he runs into a, one of the parents. The parent says, oh, my daughter took your class, blah, 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 I just absolutely loved you. And he said, well, thank you. I'm, I'm sure he didn't say this, but he enjoys being loved like we all enjoy being loved. And then he said, but I had a question for you. I said, I took that same class 30 years ago, and I just looked at the final exam you gave her. You asked exactly the same questions. Why haven't you changed your exam? And he says, well, the questions are still the same, but the answers are different now. And this is the point, that we are constantly in this conversation ongoing. Now then, how does this relate to the, the challenge of technology? And I'll get into this a little bit more later on. How do we create in technology that kind of ongoing conversation where nothing is conclusive, everything is subject to interpretation, where every interpretation changes with generation, with culture, with perspective, where we live in a kind of squishy world that is also an extremely exciting world because these discussions go on forever. And I think that my job as a humanities professor is not so much to give students answers, but to start this discussion. So I think the real question that we have in trying to incorporate technology into humanistic teaching is bringing that kind of questioning, that kind of space for interpretation, that kind of suspicion of conclusions into uh, our discussion. The last thing I'd like to say about the humanities that makes us different is that we might not think of truth in the way the scientists think of truth, but we do think a great deal about plausibility. Now, let me give you an example of this. Think of somebody in this room you know. Don't look at that person, please. Okay, just think of somebody you know. Now tell me, how much do you know about that person's fantasy life? How do you know about that person's childhood? How do you know about that person's frustrated loves? How do you know about frustrated ambitions? How about fears? How about problems of self-esteem? How about secret addiction problems? There's a very good chance you don't know any of those things about most of the people, or if you do, you know very few. And yet if you take a fictional character, it's very likely you'll know all of those things about the person. Now this is truth of plausibility. We can say Holden Caulfield never really existed. And yes, that's right. He does not have a presence in a material sense. But in our imaginary, he's extremely real. And we know more about him than we're very likely to know about any real person. Now, that kind of plausibility is so important. I'll give you one more example of this. Macbeth is a historical figure. Macbeth is also a figure in a Shakespeare play. Now, that historical Macbeth, what do we know about him? Not very much. But what do we know about Shakespeare's Macbeth, this plausible character rather than this true character? We know a great deal. We know about ambition. We know how corrosive ambition can be. We know how ambition can lead one to uh, kill. So what we have here is a situation where the plausibility of a fictional character, in some sense, is so much richer than we will ever get out of simple observation. We cannot simply confine ourselves to the facts. Now, I know that I don't want to say that we do not worry about facts. We do worry about facts. We worry about evidence. We worry about arguments. 
But in all of this, we recognize that those kinds of methods ultimately are limiting. So getting back to the question for this conference, or this discussion rather, uh, how do we bring this into technology, these kinds of discussions into technology? And uh, that will be our second point. So thank you. Great. Thank you both. I think it lays out the landscape really nicely. Uh, and you've already begun to touch on this, but the second question, what's the role of technology and pedagogy in your school? And I think more importantly, how do you envision that changing in the coming years? So we'll stay here with you, Nicholas, if you want to start this one. Oh, I was waiting for Lynn to give Oh, well, we're uh, uh, shifting it up a little. Well, <laughs> first of all, let me say that um, Lynn had these wonderful examples of how we can't predict where things are going to go. How many people here probably exhausted your college budget buying 12-inch vinyl records? A few of us did. <laughs> how many of you then went out and bought a bunch of CDs? How have you now realized that storing those CDs is a real pain in the neck because something has changed? And what I want to say here is the route of technology is very, very difficult to, to, to predict. It's very disruptive, and we can see a number of areas it's been, it has disrupted, and it's certainly going to be disruptive in the university situation. But the one thing that I would say that I, that I can predict is that through technology, we have access to information that we could not even conceive 50 years ago. And I'll give an example from the School of Humanities because both of them are sitting here on the front row. Uh, one of the more interesting projects, you, I know, I, I, and listen, I'm going to give such a poor rendition of this, they'll probably be very angry at me afterwards. But one of the more exciting projects we have right now is a kind of synchronic, diachronic map of the city of Rio de Janeiro that's being developed by a professor of uh, architectural history and a professor of social and political history in Brazil. Now, what does this map do? First of all, this is a map that will allow you to go to any place in that map and go backwards in time and see what this city looked like at different points throughout time. You can also see what the city looks like now. You can access pictures, you can access text. And so you can have a base of knowledge here that would be almost unthinkable without that technology. Now, where does the human ask come into this? Somebody's got to interpret that. Somebody has to decide what this means. But that access to that kind of knowledge is something we simply didn't have before. Uh, anything that deals with visual objects, I'm thinking, for example, I'm getting a little far afield of the humanities here at Rice, music history, for example. Now, if you can imagine the way we can look at a dissertation in music history now, where you can actually see the score, you can actually hear the music, you can parse out the parts, and you can do this all in one place and read it at the same time. How wonderful it would have been to do that, or how would we have done that 30 years ago? We simply could not have. So I think that one of the biggest things that's happening in technology is the way it gives us access to information and assembling information in ways that we would not have conceived of before. Uh, one last example of how disruptive technology can be. Uh, how many of you know what a card catalog is? <laughs> Do we use the card catalog no, now? Does anybody even know where the card catalog is in the Fondren Library? The University of Texas, they hid it. I know where it is, but it was hidden. But when I go online and I use electronic card catalogs, what I see many times, and maybe this is me looking for something I shouldn't look at, is I see something that looks like that old card. Now let's think, what would a catalog look like of all of these sources of information if we didn't have that old card catalog as a point of reference? How would we organize knowledge if our point of departure was modern technology and not that old card catalog? Now, I'm incapable of answering that question, but I would guess that we would organize knowledge in a very, very different fashion. We would. Uh, well, let me follow along on, on Nick's uh, theme here, and I, and I think also, again, going back to the, um, the concept of how you teach in this technologically rich era that we're living in, it seems to me one of the things that 
oh, it opens up, and it certainly has opened it up for the for various people in the social sciences, is actually teaching research on social media, for example, something that we would not even have thought about, um, you know, even maybe 15 years ago. But, but now there's an opportunity to actually engage students based on the way in which they communicate. Um, it's, it's kind of a fascinating but very minor note that in the 2000 presidential election, there was actually discussion among both camps as to whether or not they should have a website. If you can imagine that kind of conversation now, we wouldn't even conceive of something like that. There isn't a corner of sort of human life that isn't somehow connected to social media. And it gives us an opportunity. I mean, it goes back to my comment earlier about the sort of diffidence in some ways of the social science faculty of doing large online sort of pieces. But the technological aspects of things are everywhere and are extremely rich and allow us to bring things quite regularly home to the students through Facebook, uh, which they're always on anyway. And so why not use the literature that's emerging on how Facebook has, has transformed, it's, it transforms economies, it transforms politics, it transforms the way in which people speak. Um, you know, I'm always fascinated by the, 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 not just LOL, which I finally know what that means, but all the other sort of shorthands that emerge from texting, for instance. So it's not just Facebook, but it's, it's a variety of those kinds of things. So I think we have an opportunity to engage students in that way. The other thing that I think is, is really quite important is to sort of tie together, and I think Rice students are very, very adept at this, of tying together cutting edge research that's technologically driven with the sorts of things that they want to learn. And so I'm, I'm thinking in this case about two projects, one of which is a very large uh, sort of big data project that Melissa Marshall in political science engaged in over a, a fair number of years in which she now has a program that can pull out every single story from a variety of news sources on local elections, and it puts these things all together in one searchable uh, database and becomes the source of all kinds of questions that students could never have answered before about how people perceive local candidates, about how people give money to local candidates, and so on and so forth. I mean, before it was all done on the back of a, remember, three by five cards, right? The sort of equivalent of, of Nick's, um, uh, Nick's card catalog. And, and the other thing, of course, is GPS, which in fact is being used across the social sciences to answer all kinds of questions. Uh, one of the most fascinating right now here in Houston is how pollution affects the way people behave as neighbors and how, of course, they set up particular health protocols based on the sort of pollution that exists in their neighborhoods. Um, so really, really fascinating kinds of things that are going on in research through technology that allows us to then communicate those very things and allow students to participate in, in those projects. Um, and one final thing that I'll say in, in terms of just my own experience is that despite the fact that these are Rice students, they still are 18, 19, and 20 year olds, typically 21. And oftentimes they don't have a really strong connection to history. There's oftentimes, a, you know, my, one of my favorite um, examples, not from a Rice student, but it's still apropos, somebody came up to me after class when I was teaching an American presidency class, and they go, so there were two Roosevelts? And it's that kind of ahistorical approach that actually technology allows you to cut through very, very quickly. Because I can pull, I can pull a, uh, a little video clip, I can pull, when people talk about, you know, Watergate or something like that, and they go, well, what was that? You know, well, here happens to be a conversation between the President of the United States and his Chief of Staff about how you could get a million dollars and you could pay um, Cuban exiles in order to, to shut them up. Uh, you know, it, it brings a sort of reality to the way in which students can grasp historical examples and, and really begin to see how things did unfold um, not just since, um, you know, the, the night sort of 2000 or, or so. So I will stop there. <laughs>
Thank you both very much. Uh, our final question before we open it up to the audience. How can your school have a positive impact in teaching across the entire campus outside of your school? Dean Ragsdale, we'll start with you. Well, I was just going to be straight up and, and acknowledge that we probably don't do an incredibly good job at that because, you know, we're not, I mean, we have department-based learning and departments really feel very, very strongly about their curriculum. They feel very, very strongly about what needs to be captured within a particular major and a particular degree program and so on. And then I began to think, well, but actually we do have a series of minors that have evolved over the last decade or so here, which actually do get us out of out of our own little nests. And so I can think of three of them right off the top of my head. Neuroscience minor has been a great opportunity for students to see both the human behavior side, but also the molecular side of neuroscience. And, you know, we, we talked about that for years. Lots of people were instrumental in bringing that forward. It is a huge, huge hit in terms of the number of students who are taking those classes and are, are, are um, working through the minor. Uh, the second one is a, a new minor that I think was just approved by the Senate on Environment and Sustainability, which is a really fascinating sort of um, combination, literally, of sort of the cultures of energy, the cultures of, of how people perceive the environment, and then the actual science of sustainability and the science of, of environmental uh, policy and, and so on. And then a third on, on um, political theory and law, uh, which gives a, another blend of things, both from philosophy and history and, and political science. And so it, I think what's interesting is that although we are department-based, and I'm actually probably one of the biggest proponents of department-based um, learning in the context particularly not just of undergraduate but also of graduate programs, Nonetheless, minors in particular for us give students an opportunity to sort of see both sides of, a, of, a, of, a, of the same coin. They allow students to sort of explore things without necessarily um, knowing what the answers are going to be before they get to the end of that minor. Uh, and, and so I think that's, that's helped us um, get out of our little boxes, as it were. Well, first of all, I don't really want to be so pretentious that I can tell other people on campus how to teach. That's not what we're about. But I would like to uh, follow up on something Lynn said. Uh, I think it's very interesting in this course you taught on American presidencies, and you talked about the students that don't have any historical knowledge. Now, this is not a question you need to answer, but it is a very important question for us to think about. When does political science stop and history start? Where is the line between these? And what we see here is that there's a real blending of these two. And when you start trying to draw firm lines between disciplines, you run into these kinds of problems. Uh, it doesn't surprise me at all that a course on the presidency might be taught in political science department, but it would really surprise me a lot if they only talked about, you know, Bush and uh, Obama. That's just not the way it's going to go. So you see these blending. Second thing I would say is that the humanities are really on the make. We are looking for partners. We are looking for people to work with us. And you can see this in some of the uh, new minors that we've created in disciplinary minors. And one of these minors is precisely the one that Lynn just mentioned, one on political thought and philosophy. Uh, that minor is going to be housed in the School of Humanities. But it's going to be using professors from uh, the social sciences, obviously, in major, major ways. Second item, I just interviewed a candidate for a position that we have in philosophy. This is a position in the uh, philosophy of mind. Uh, very bright candidate. I don't know which one's going to get the job, but I was really impressed with this young man. Uh, his first question, though, was, is it possible to collaborate across departments? And I said, yes, Rice is a very friendly place. It's easy to make friends across the departmental lines. And if you really want to do this, the, the uh, Humanities Research Center makes a specialty of contacting people. And I said, and then we have the medical center. He said, no, but the people I'm really interested in are the people in neuropsychology, the people in psychology. And so he comes here with a degree with a specialty in philosophy of mind, but recognizing that he has to partner with other disciplines to really do what he wants to do. Now, the last thing I would say about uh, how we might influence other 
departments is, this is going to sound probably a little bit maybe out of line. Uh, but I think we have to realize that this vast amount of knowledge that we can access now because of technology is a great blessing. It's also a really great problem. Now, to give you an idea of how can you have a big problem it is, I would like you to all close your eyes. Close your eyes, Alida. And I would think about, consider what is going on right now on the big toe of your left foot. Can you feel your big toe of your left foot? You see what it's doing there, warm, cozy in your foot, everything like that. Now, what your, you can open your eyes now. What your left toe is experiencing is part of the past. It's history. It's, it's, it's a fact. It's something that's there. Now then, somebody give me an idea of why you will not probably remember what your left toe was feeling like on this particular date at 20 minutes almost to 5 o'clock. Why will that not be used? Well, the fact is that when we generate knowledge, the first thing we do is we eliminate. We simply cannot absorb all of the information out there. So the first task of remembering is forgetting. The first task of remembering is discarding all this information that we cannot possibly deal with. The second thing we do is we say, if I say, well, why don't you want to remember what your big toe is feeding right now? I'm sure somebody would say, because it's not important. And then I would ask, why is it important? Who made that judgment? What are your criteria? By what standards do you privilege something else over what your big toe was feeling? And you'd have to come up with some sort of reasons for saying that. And then the last thing that I would say is, uh, why do we come up with a classification system that doesn't necessarily use big toes? And the answer is that we cannot retain all the knowledge we have now because we have to interpret, we have to eliminate, we have to organize. So the real challenge of technology has just made that task so much more complicated because we have so much more information available. That task of remembering and forgetting, interpreting, classifying, privileging is now infinitely more complicated for us. And I'm not sure that we're ever going to find technology able to do that. Great. Well, on that note, I'd like to open up the floor for Q&A. I see one already. I'd like to know to what degree you consider students to be a resource in your development. Uh, specifically to address uh, the neuroscience minor, I remember that my students in biosciences were very eager to promote that. Nazima Zakadova, I think, was probably one of your uh, resources there. And sadly, she was in medical school before it, it became a reality. In terms of art, I mean, I've had my students come to me and help me with my MOOC in making illustrations in science. And so their abilities in both art and understanding science have been a huge help to me in what I was doing. And I'm just, just kind of wondering what your thoughts are um, about using all of our very, very wonderful, smart, tech-savvy students to help you do the things you need to do. I mean, I'd be lost without mine. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, as a, the neuroscience thing, of course, is, is a very good example of student-driven demand for a particular area of knowledge, a particular area of expertise. Um, and and I, I completely agree, we, wouldn't, we would not have the neuroscience minor in the way that it looks today without that kind of student, without that kind of student input. Uh, I, I think, you know, your broader point about technology and the, and the use of technology is also at, because essentially we're saying, look, let's listen to what students are telling us about how they do or don't use technology, and use that to sort of inform how we can interpret things within the classroom, interpret the use of social media, and, and so on. And I think, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I, so, uh, I had a question about uh, the uh, role of mathematics in political science and sociology in particular. particular. 
uh, there, that has really become the thing in, in both those areas in terms of doing research. Uh, and I was wondering what sort of mathematical background, also in economics, what sort of ma mathematical background do you look for uh, in requiring of your psychology and social sociology and economics majors? Right. So all of those majors have um, statistics requirements in the in the major. Exactly. Yeah. So it could certainly go. You know, I would say almost everybody who comes out with one of those degrees would have that capacity. Uh, obviously, in in economics, particularly in math, econ, they would go beyond that into sort of advanced econometrics and so on. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that there is a blending, if you will, of statistics and social science in in those in those disciplines. I was interested in listening to comments about the role of technology in teaching, and a little surprised that you guys didn't back up a little bit and talk about teaching in general and the future of teaching. Uh, which needn't be technologically driven. Um, so I'll just speak from my own experience. I'm used to getting up lecturing in front of a bunch of students who passively take, maybe take notes or, or play on Facebook as I'm, as I'm rattling on. But we're learning a lot about new methods for keeping attention and how to present information that needn't rely on technology. And so where can you see your roles as deans in pushing uh, some of us old farts to change our ways and maybe adopt new technologies. I, I know it's like herding cats, but nonetheless. Do you have any thoughts? You're going to feel that one. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> um, herding cats is a good metaphor. Uh, the metaphor I like is uh, trying to push a wet noodle through a keyhole. Um, I don't really see my role as pushing faculty. Um, now, I think we have to be aware of what technology can do. You know, the MOOCs that we, the, I mentioned earlier, the access to information that we have now, um, and how we also have to be cautious with this information. You know, the, the question about mathematics, for example, um, we have to be careful with this attitude that seems to exist in some places if you can't count it, kill it. Um, I remember um, at the University of Texas, the political science department, sorry, actually it's the government department. It is the government. They organized a meeting uh, that I helped fund when I was head of the Institute of Latin American Studies um, on the recent elections in Mexico. Now these elections were, these were elections when Calderon was elected, and it was called the first hundred days. Well, I thought this was a fascinating topic. I lived in Mexico for a couple of years, and I'm very fascinated by Mexico. So I went to the conference, and besides that, since my institute, my institute, the institute that I directed, uh, funded, I thought I had a right to be there. I heard all sorts of talks about correlation of income level to vote, correlation of uh, uh, area of origin, whether they were from northern Mexico or southern Mexico. I heard a lot of information about gender relationships to voting patterns. I learned a lot of information about income level to voting patterns and the, people, the kind of people with certain kinds of everything that you could count. What I didn't hear in that conference was a single mention of human being. Um, and this, of course, struck me as very, very odd, that you could actually talk about politics and not talk about politicians. That seemed very strange to me. Um, your question about uh, uh, how we teach, obviously there are methods out there that we have to work with. The, the flipped classroom, for example. Now, most in the humanities, we're used to the, cl the flipped classroom, but we're used to it because it has only one flip in it. It's usually a seminar table with a professor and some students working about a problem. But the challenge of being able to teach a large lecture class, for example, Introduction to Religion, which is one of our most popular courses in the humanities. In fact, I think it's our heaviest, uh, our most enrolled course in the School of Humanities. Could this be taught with a series of students working on specific problems in teams. Now that would be a real challenge because that old lecture model is still with us to such a degree. 
Although, if you look at our small seminars, in some sense, we've been doing flipped classrooms for a very long time. It's just that we don't call them that. We call them seminars, and we go back a long ways in doing that. But, but also, I would say, yeah, I mean, you're right that there is, of course, a sort of professorial model, right, which says, I get up, I'm super smart, I'm going to invoke you know, my smartness on you, you write it down, you give it back to me on the test, and you get, you get graded accordingly. But I do think that there is now, and I think a lot of the conversations that we've had over the last several years about online learning and other sorts of things have led people to actually think, wait a minute, we actually have a lot of data on how people learn and, and, and in the ways in which they learn best. And one of the conclusions of almost all of those studies, whether they're in psychology or ed psych or if they're coming out of STEM or, or wherever, is that active learning is actually primary. And, and so, I mean, yes, of course, the professorial model will probably never die. But at least when I think across the, the, the curriculum in the social sciences, there are a whole lot of faculty who are very very heavily engaged in active learning, whether it's a specific simulation within a part of the course, whether it's a flipped uh, set of problems that are being presented, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's actually going out and doing something within, within Houston to test out what it's like to be on food stamps or what it's like to be, uh, you know, to live in, in a particular part of Houston or, or whatever. I mean, I think there, there is a, there is a greater recognition of that, and I do think that there are more people incorporating that into the classroom. Um, will we ever give up on our pithiest lectures? Well, maybe not, but I do think there's more, there's more awareness that we need to go beyond our pithy lectures. And if I just might put a tiny footnote on that, supposedly we are professors because we know something the students don't. Um, and I use a personal example here. When I was an undergraduate, I was in an honors program. And in that honors program, they allowed us to not take core courses. We, could, we were smart enough to figure out what we needed to know. Um, this means that when I was a senior, I finally decided I, we did have general requirements. When I was a senior, I took a course in botany and math and physics because I put them off till my senior year. Much to my surprise, I loved those courses. And I will always be somewhat resentful of those people who thought that I was so smart that I didn't need to have somebody tell me what I needed to study. John? So it turns out your last comment, Nick, is a perfect lead in and actually maybe actually even answer the question I was about to ask. Uh, as we all know, there's an increasing tendency these days to think of an education as an investment and for our students and their parents to be focused primarily on what they regard as their return on their investment as they come in, which can produce a sense of kind of a consumerism view of education. And it strikes me as though, particularly for the humanities, but also in many of the social sciences, that that consumerism poses a risk in disciplines that might not be viewed as to have a significant return on investment. So I'm interested in your reactions to this new push towards um, a kind of a consumer model of education. I think my primary reaction is that it's perverse. Uh, is that clear enough? The answer, I no. The reason, uh, going back to where I started, you know, humanistic study is the beginning of a conversation. It means that you can take a course in art history, but that means 40 years later, you can still go to an art exhibit and enter into a dialogue with the objects that you see. That you can take a course in literature and 40 years later, you can see a play by a modern playwright and still ask the same kinds of questions, interpretive questions, and trying to figure out what it was. So the notion that you, you got an education, you are now prepared, you go out, I think that's exactly wrong. Now, I think it is important that people get jobs, be able to do things, you know, uh, make money. I mean, we don't want our students sleeping under bridges, but we don't have any students sleeping under bridges. But what I'm really concerned is that this life of the mind that we try to ignite in our undergraduates is a lifelong endeavor. 
Uh, it's not something you consume. It's not something you say, it's now mine. In fact, I can't imagine anybody more boring than the person who says, I now know everything on this subject that needs to be known. That's a real conversation stopper. Well, and also I would say that the consumer model has been around for a long time. I mean, it didn't just start. Um, but I think what we as professors sometimes slip away from is communicating how important developing analytic skills are, developing statistical skills, developing um, the ability to propose hypotheses and, and so on. I think we kind of, we don't do our students any favors by not emphasizing that that's part of the value added. It's not just going outside the classroom and having having rich experiences and so on, but it's also what your mind does between the time you're a senior in high school and the time you're a senior in college. And, and I think we don't emphasize that part enough. You know, I mean, I think the consumerism piece has been around for, for a very long time. I just heard on the radio this morning an interview with a young student at Texas A&M who's getting a degree in petroleum engineering and is scared to death because she can't find a job because BP just dismissed I don't know how many thousands of employees. I think of the people I studied with who got degrees in nuclear engineering. That was supposed to be the new field of the future. I think, you know, that the, what we really give students that's absolutely important prepares them for a life of learning, a life of being teachable. And the disciplines that they learn that in are somewhat, to some sense, irrelevant. That's what we're really after. Other questions? In, in my experience, faculty bring to the classroom uh, enormous depth and expertise in content. What they don't necessarily bring to the classroom is expertise in teaching methods or in curriculum design. What um, I would like to ask is, as deans, what you might want to do uh, to support and encourage and resource professional development for faculty in those areas. Well, I'll, I'll try to answer that with a, a personal example. Um, at the University of Texas, we had a young teacher who, in his first year, got absolutely appalling evaluation. Uh, we had a center there in teaching excellence. I don't think it was exactly the same thing we have here. But it was certain things that this person didn't know. He didn't know how to put together a syllabus. He didn't know how to say, uh, this is what my expectations are. Uh, this is a reading list that you can actually read and not kill yourself. And, and so I think there's a lot to be learned about how to go about things. But at the end of the day, you've got to have the content. The person has to know what the subject is. But certainly there are better ways of presenting that. And the challenge of technology is we have so many other media now available for presenting information. And I'm not smart enough to know where that's going to go, but I'm sure that it will be disruptive and exciting. Well, I would also say, I mean, first of all, of course, we're really thrilled that we have at least Josh and his team to help bring exactly your question to the fore, right? Because I think faculty do assume that they, they know how to convey things when in fact a lot of times that isn't the case. But, but I also think it's really important that I, at least as I understand it, a lot of, of the work that Josh and his team do here, which I think is, is actually the, the right moment, and that is with graduate students. Because it's, you know, it's one thing to try to tell faculty, oh, well, you should do those things. But then, you know, they hear via the grapevine, well, but, you know, even though Rice maybe values teaching a little more than your average university, you're still supposed to be publishing like crazy in order to get promotion to tenure. So, okay, so then I've got 50 things going on, and, you know, so the... So the long and the short of it is I'm going to spend 49, 49 of those 50 things are going to be on my research, and maybe I've got one thing on teaching. But graduate students, well, you can tell graduate students what to do, right? I mean, 
within a within a range, you can you can devise a curriculum, and at least I know a, a variety of departments across the university, not just in the social sciences, have teaching requirements. They have professionalization classes that they instruct the students to go to to understand how to put together a, a syllabus, how to convey things in a clear way as opposed to in a, you know, in a, in a sort of murky way and so on. And so I, I think it's really fabulous. And here's a great plug for, for Josh and, and, and all the graduate students, you know, should, should rush over. But, um, but that's the moment that we really need to begin to think about how are you going to come out as a teacher, right? If you're, if you're in fact thinking about going into the academy, how are you going to come out as a teacher? Because you're, you're beginning your first set of of syllabi, you're beginning your first set of lectures. If you're going to use lectures, you're beginning your first set of materials, and and we can actually tell them what to do. You know, once they get their first job, it's pretty much over. So, and I would add to that that I'm really suspicious of this dichotomy between teaching and research, because I can say and I can name names in the School of Humanities. Our best teachers are frequently our best researchers. This is not. This is a false dilemma. This is a false choice. In my own personal experience, I teach for many reasons. One of them is I enjoy it. Uh, I also find interacting with students cheap therapy. They're much more appreciative than my chairs are when I have a meeting with them. But the third thing is that in my dialogue with students, that's where I get my best ideas lots of times. You know, and I'll teach a class, ideas will come up in the class, and this will be the seed for something that I might write on later on. So, I think it's important to, to recognize that knowledge comes out of that kind of conversation, and the relationship between teachers and students is a very important one. We have time for one more question, I think. Hi. Uh, Dr. Shumway, you made a comment earlier about how when you're an undergraduate, um, you kind of um, you wished that you uh, there was somebody kind of giving you more direction about like what types of classes you could take and like different um, like things that you should have to study. Um, and then so I have a kind of a question about that and like the new role of interdisciplinary kind of minors and stuff here at Rice. I'm an applied math major, but I also have a minor. I'm pursuing a minor in global health technologies, and so I'm trying to bridge those two types of interests together. But my question is, are there any resources for students to go to like professors for guidance about these types of interdisciplinary things? Because like you said earlier, professors are generally pretty uh, much within their departments and things like that. And so maybe it would be good to have resources for students that are thinking about interdisciplinary things that don't necessarily have that guidance. Well, I don't. I think there would be very few professors on this campus, or for that matter, any campus, that if you made an appointment with him or her, said, I'd like to talk about such and such, the person would say, sorry, I haven't got time for you. I don't think that happens very often. Uh, when a student seeks me out for information, I feel very flattered. Uh, and I, you know, I, I want to help. Now, one of the things that I think that, that uh, students should do is be more aggressive in using your faculty. You know, realize that these people are tools and that their job is to help you do what you want to do. Um, make an appointment, invite a faculty member to lunch, to coffee, uh, and you can ask whatever you want. You shouldn't be doing this uh, on your own. About the other part of your question about people not telling me what I needed to study, um, yes, I'm a little angry that I didn't take my science courses in my senior year, perhaps. I waited to put off to my senior year. It might have, who knows, I might have gone into an entirely different field. But I have such respect for knowledge. Things are inherently interesting. Science courses are interesting. Biological cor biology courses were interesting. These subjects have a way of reaching out and grabbing you and taking over. Uh, we don't have a conspiracy telling students that they have to get familiar with the Beethoven, the Beethoven symphonies. If they listen to the Beethoven symphonies, those symphonies will reach out and grab them and they will be addicted to the subject itself. Uh, this happened to me very recently. I decided that I was terribly ignorant about economics, so I took an economics course. And I found the dismal science absolutely fascinating. We live in a world of fascinating things. 
I understand sadness. I understand depression. I don't understand being bored. I have no idea either. Or the wrong things to ask. <laughs> no, no, well, we are and we aren't, but. Um, I thought that 12 inch long play records at 33 and a third RPMs was a fascinating and fabulous improvement in technology. Uh, I actually went into a mini depression when I heard out that Apple was not going to make iPods anymore. Uh, it's, it's just impossible to predict where technology is going to go. But the important thing for me as a dean is to make sure that there is space available for the people who can do that sort of thing, the people who can lead us in technology. But all I can do is create the space and try to find the resources. I'm not smart enough to do it myself. Well, I think, too, I mean, it goes back to there. there is fundamental research on how technology does work in certain learning environments and does not work well in certain other learning environments. So, I mean, to take your, to take your example, if you're going to spend money preponderantly on technology within a, within a specific high school, yeah, you are buying into what's known about that at that particular moment, but, but at least you're buying, you're buying things that are correctly built around a learning model that says this is how the human brain behaves in this kind of setting. So, I mean, I think that certainly can be, that can be accomplished. Will it be out of date? Sure, but, you know. Of course, if you give me the $43 billion, I'd get a lot smarter. <laughs> <laughs> a great note to end on, right? Uh, thank you both very much. If we could thank our, our deans for today. As with all of Ciencia's events, we have uh, food and drink out in the lobby, so please do enjoy. Thank you very much. <laughs>